Hello. I am glad that you have joined us. We want to spend some time in the Word of God. And uh, I have asked the Lord to bless this time and to use this message to bless your hearts and encourage you and help you to grow in the knowledge of God. In Colossians chapter 1, where we have a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul describes his attributes and, all, and so many things about him. But then he says, For by him, speaking of the Lord Jesus, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist or are held together. A part of the apostles' prayer for the believers at Colossae is found in verse 10 of that first chapter where he prays that they would increase in the knowledge of God. And that's my prayer today. I have no agenda. I have, I have no ax to grind. I simply want to teach you uh, scripture and I want you to grow and increase in the knowledge of God. Dr. Michael Heiser who is now with the Lord, said the Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first, we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. So I ask you, do you believe what's in your Bible? There are parts of what the Bible reveals about the spiritual world that may seem heretical to you because so much has been suppressed over the past 100 years in modern Western fundamental Christianity. In our modern world, even as Christians, we tend to be very selective in what we believe because we were raised in a post-enlightenment age, which causes us to be suspicious of a supernatural worldview. We find that somehow we can believe in things like the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That we can believe in the Incarnation, that the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary in such a way that she conceived and bore the very Son of God. We can believe in the deity of Christ, that he was in fact God, and we can believe in the hypostatic union, which means a belief that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and that both natures fully exist in one person. But there are verses which we sometimes struggle with. For instance, in Psalm 82 and verse 1, we read in this psalm of Asaph, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. When you look at Psalm 
82 verse 1. It, it's kind of shocking. But there it is, plain as day. God presides over an assembly of gods that he calls his sons. We'll, we'll look at that in several passages a little later. We're not used to thinking of the heavenly hosts in those terms, but that's what the Hebrew text says. Psalm 89 says the same thing about God's counsel in the heavens. Verse 5, Psalm 89, verse 5, And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. But in the Hebrew, it's in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the heavens? In the Hebrew, it's in the skies. Can be compared to the Lord. All in caps, which signifies that he's speaking of Yahweh, or, or as we know him, Jehovah, who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to Yahweh? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Again, in the Hebrew, in, in the council of the holy ones and to be held in reverence, Hebrew, it's like this, awesome. He's awesome above all who surround him. By the way, we are told that the divine council is in the skies. It's not on earth where people are, we're not talking about spiritual human leaders. This council is, is in the skies. They're, they're heavenly beings. And they're not idols. They're, there's no group of idols in the sky taking orders from God. And look at Psalm 82, verse 6. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Sons of the Most High? Is it being unfaithful to the text to think sons of God? No, of course not. The Hebrew word translated God in Psalm 82 is Elohim. Most of the time, it should be translated with a capital G. God, G-O-D, singular. But sometimes it's plural with a small g. Gods, G-O-D-S. Here in Psalm 82 and verse 1, the word Elohim occurs twice, once singular, once plural. Psalm 82 verse 1 has both. When we put an S at the end of G-O-D, it makes us uneasy. But Elohim is simply a word used to describe a supernatural being. That's why the biblical writers use the word Elohim for other spirit beings besides God. However, among all those Elohim, those spiritual beings, we find that Yahweh is one of those Elohim, and no other Elohim is like him. I repeat, no other Elohim is like 
him. The Bible describes him in unique ways. There is only one of him, one of him, existing as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he is the creator of, as we read in Colossians chapter 1, he is the creator of all of the Elohim. In Exodus 15 and verse 11, we read, Who is like you, O Lord, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful, in praises and in Psalm 29 and verse 1 give unto the Lord give unto Yahweh O you mighty ones or in the Hebrew you sons of God or, or sons of might give unto Yahweh glory and strength Psalm 86 and verse 8 among the gods, plural, Elohim, there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. In Psalm 95 and verse 3, for the Lord, Yahweh, is the great God and the great King above all God. You remember the story of Job. Job is going through difficulty that most of us would have just wilted under. But as he goes through all of his trouble, Job is trying to figure out the why of all of his problems. Since God is sovereign, Job knows that ultimately God is in control. Job just doesn't understand, and he is questioning. And in Job 38 and verses 3 through 7, God is speaking to Job. He says in verse 3, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? But look at verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, that uh, phrase morning stars throughout the scriptures in various places refers to angelic beings. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, folks, this was during the creation. This was before there were any people. The sons of God had already been created. And then you remember the story at Babel. In Genesis 11, um, Moses gives us the story beginning at verse 1, chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly 
They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Verse 5 says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. And they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go. Let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. For the Lord so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them, scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. When describing this event in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses said in verse 8, When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. But wait, wait, wait. In the Hebrew, it reads this way. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. May I suggest that when he divided the peoples, into various places upon the earth, into what would become nations. They, they spoke now uh, as a group the same language, and this group spoke the same language, and this group spoke the same language, and so they would become nations. That he divided them according to the sons of God, and he placed over these nations spirit beings who had as their responsibility to oversee and govern and lead them correctly. In the book of Daniel, chapter 10, we find a, a passage in chapter 9, uh, if you're familiar with Daniel at all, you'll know that chapter 9 is filled with Daniel's prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a, it's a prayer of seeking God. And then we come to chapter 10, and let's pick up at verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze, in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Very similar to the description of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. But let's go ahead. 
Drop down, if you will, to verse 12. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Your prayers reach heaven. And I have come because of your words. I have come in answer to your prayer. Look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. Then drop down to verse 19. And he said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. Look at verse 20. Then he said, Do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia, which, by the way, in our modern day, would be the prince of Iran. I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince, the prince of Israel. So, we have confirmation in Daniel chapter 10 of different spiritual beings being given the responsibility over various people groups and nations. In Job, Speaking of all of his problems, look at chapter 1. And in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Look in chapter 2. And in chapter 2 of Job, look at verse 1. Again, there was a day, this is another day. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And he answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth in it. Now I want to take you to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6 which for many years has been such a controversial passage. And I suggest to you that it really should not be a controversial passage. We've seen the sons of God in various situations. And we understand them to be spirit beings, spiritual princes, if you will. But there are those that 
read Genesis 6 and verses 1 through 4, but they do not accept the term sons of God at face value. May I lovingly suggest there are some who would hold down or suppress the truth, Romans chapter 1 says. Maybe there are others who, who are innocent. Maybe perhaps they just haven't studied it enough to see all of the connections. But look at verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, now folks, every other place we've seen that term in the Old Testament, it has referred to spiritual, angelic type beings. Do we dare not be honest with the Word of God? Do we dare come and say, well, it doesn't mean that here? Whatever the term means in various other places, it must mean the same here. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, Yahweh said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his day shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 describes a supernatural rebellion. Some of the sons of God, members of the heavenly council, transgress the boundary between heaven and earth and they cohabited with human daughters. You might say, but Brother Harry, I thought the Bible teaches that angels are sexless. The Bible does not teach that. That erroneous teaching comes from a misinterpretation of Mark chapter 12 and verse 25, where we read, for when they rise from the dead in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now wait, wait, let's be honest with the Word of God. Let's be honest with what Jesus says. He does not say they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels. Then we might have a reason to say, well, uh, angels must be sexless. But he says like angels in heaven. But when rebellious angels are up on the earth where they see the daughters of men that they are beautiful. There is nothing in the scripture that says that they cannot cohabit with them. And in fact, there are many passages that say just the opposite. By the way, If you will think about it, every angel that is named in the scripture is given a man's name. Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. I've been 
reading the Bible for years, I've never seen an angel named Henrietta. And notice their offspring. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old men of re re renown. The word giants is the Hebrew word Nephilim. It literally means fallen one. And later, there is a reference to the offspring of this type of a relationship, and they are called earthborn. Now, if these were the children of human men and human women, why would they be called earthborn? Of course they would be earthborn. These are the offspring of spiritual beings and human women. And so they are referred to as earthborn. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, we read, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, We're going to find which sin he's referring to in the book of Jude, just in a moment. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And in Jude, Jude has one chapter, verses 6 and 7, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then he, he gives us a kind of like this as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He says there are angels who did not keep their proper domain. They left their own abode like, like Sodom and Gomorrah. They went after strange flesh. They gave themselves over to sexual immorality. Now if you say, well, when it says that the angels that sinned refers to Satan's angels, my friend, if, if you think that all of Satan's angels who sinned and rebelled against God are, are in chains, you haven't been listening to the daily newscast. There are angels who sinned and they committed immorality with human women. And they produced an offspring, which are called fallen ones, and even earthborn. We'll pick up there and continue in our next message. Let's pause and have a word of prayer as we close today. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to love it. Help us to be honest with it when we read it and when we teach it and when we interpret it. Lord, your, your word helps us to fathom you 
and to know you and to love you and to know how you work and, and how you govern all things so that we might humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We ask this through the name of Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.